So we have 27 people at this time. I think we had about 70 people register. So I just want to thank you again. Thank you <laughs> for joining us. Um, definitely love your work. Came across your book, actually watching the uh, Ujima's broadcast and said, wow, this is amazing. I saw that we were connected. So some mutual people that are doing amazing work like Renee Hatcher. And I said, okay, let me, let me reach out. And uh, so I ordered the book and really wanted to make sure, like we, we launched collectively in, in 2019 and spent the first two years really wanted to be about relationship building. And now in, in 2021, being a little bit more intentional, start some of the political education work and, and really start some of the organizing work. And so excited to have you here as our first guest. Uh, we'll have three guests this month. And so thank you again for joining us. I'm going to, for folks who are watching, I know we have some folks from Canada and from across the US. So for folks who aren't familiar with um, Collectively, I'm gonna sort of go a brief overview of what we're doing and then I'll introduce Dr. Hussein. Um, again, Dr. Hussein is from York University in Canada. I'll read her bio, introduce her, and then she'll move forward with her presentation. So again, thank you all for joining us. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, I thought it wasn't gonna let me put it is. We making it. And I do tech stuff and I'm you know I'm all over the place today. <laughs> You're funny. Oh, nice. So again, as I was saying, we, we launched collectively in, in 2019 to be a resource for those that seek to find, fund, and partner with black social change organizations. Um so I'll quickly go through an overview introduce Dr. Our, our lecturer and guest speaker for today, Dr. Caroline Hussein, and then opening up for Q and A for those who are in the chat. And we have a Q and A function as well. Hopefully today is able to jump back in and assist us with this. If not, we'll make it happen. Also in doing this month up next, next week will be uh, Susan Taylor Batten. She is CEO of AFI, Association of Black Foundation Executives. I'm currently a, a fellow there. And she's been writing a lot um, around what she calls philanthropic redlining in the case for funding black led organizations and black social change. So she'll join us next week at 630 and we'll have Zoom all figured out by that time. <laughs> and then for those um, particularly in the Baltimore early area will know about um, Dr. Joanne Martin. She is the founder of the Great Blacks and Wax Museum here. Um, but also a social worker and her husband and her did amazing work. And she's gonna to talk to us about the helping traditions in the black family and community. So again, we wanted to make sure that we started off this year um, saying that, our, that this work is, is not new to us, but true to us, that um, this is not innovative in the sense of collectively, but that we're really just building off of the traditions uh, of our ancestors and standing on their shoulders. So a little bit about collectively, we launched again, in 2019, but in 2015, after the murder of Freddie Gray, that I co-founded Baltimore United for Change with a coalition of about 10 organizations. And, and during that time, we launched the Skills Bank. And the Skills Bank was to be an on-ramp for folks who weren't necessarily on the ground, but who wanted to plug in. So we had over 260 individuals and organizations join that Skills Bank. Um, I'm a mental health provider, I'm a lawyer, I'm a photographer, I'm a graphic designer, how, am I, how might I plug in? So we sort of used that Skills Bank internally as a coalition. And the goal with collectively was how might we make a more face forward platform for to uh, cast a bigger net to all black led organizations in Baltimore. We also heard um, from foundations at that time that they didn't necessarily know who was on the ground. And so we, we know that there's hundreds of black led organizations serving in our community. And so we launched with our asset map to begin mapping some of our black led organizations serving in Baltimore. As we say, community organizations often work in silos. These silos lead to fragmentation. Fragmentation leads to duplication, and duplication leads to wasted resources, our time, talent, and treasure. Collectively, as a place-based social change organization, generating Black genius, narrative power, social networks, and resource mobilization. Our mission is to end the fragmentation and duplication of programs, to learn about each other and be a resource for the greater Baltimore community that seeks to find, fund, and partner with Black social change. So we have these sort of six phases. Again, we launched with our asset map, a rectory, um, not just so foundations and funders could find black led organizations, but also that we could do our own due diligence. Often, you know, we jump out and there's a need, there's a problem in community and we wanna start a new program. And I'm hoping too that the asset map begins to give community-based organizations and leaders the ability to do their own due diligence to see what exists already. Maybe there's ways to partner or collaborate with existing organizations 
um, that are already in community or to find your own niche. What is that area that might be missing um, within community? Amplify is our second phase of the multimedia project where we begin telling the stories of black led organizations um, currently where we started our artists and residency program in the fall of 2020, the Wakanda Collective, they're doing amazing work, currently working with Blackwater, um, putting together a web series where we begin to highlight and tell the stories of black art, black activism and community. So exciting, look out for that um, in April as we launch. Skills Bank, which we're now calling Connect, will launch um, later in March as an app to foster greater collaboration and skill share. Um, so our strategic partnerships, our social impact institute will become collective design, which is around collaboration and building um, deepening relationships and community. Of course, our fund for Black Futures, our monthly Michael Grant, as well as our giving circle and our solidarity fund. So why is our focus on Black led social change, particularly in Baltimore, is the long story history of disinvestment within the African American community. Over the past hundred years, policies such as segregation, restricted covenants, and redlining have led to a city where over 28% of African Americans reside residents live in poverty. So we know from the philanthropic side, as Dr. Susan Batten, Batten talks about this philanthropic redlining, but out of the $60 billion in foundation funding, black-led organizations only receive about 2% of that. Um, according to some of the racial wealth data, it would take 228 years to earn the same amount of wealth um, that white families have today. If the wealth divide is left unaddressed, median black households' wealth is on a path to hit zero by 2053. We know the unemployment rate for black households in Baltimore is over three times the rate for white households. And that 32% of black Baltimore households have no household net worth. And that 67% did not survive more than three months in the absence of income. Again, this is, this is pre-COVID data, right? Mm -hmm. That didn't last. So we know the type of situations our communities must be in. As a 26 year old man in Baltimore earns about 28% less than he would um, if he grew up somewhere else in, in, in America, average America. So what are we focusing on? We're focusing on shifting power, mobilizing resources, shifting power in the sense of you know, the right to be self-determined. How do communities have the ability to decide for themselves on what is best for themselves? So we do that through centering black genius, narrative power, social networks, and resource mobilization. Just a few definitions of, of how we're Finding black genius, so an asset-based framework rooted in the self-determination that recognizes the genius within our local community, believes that those most impacted by an issue are the primary building blocks of a sustainable community. Narrative power, Malcolm X said, if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Like the storytelling helps us make sense of the world around us and carry the culture forward. Through storytelling, we are reclaiming our narrative and centering black genius. Social networks, right? Relationships move at the speed of trust and social movements move at the speed of relationships. My dear sister, I heard Jennifer Bailey speak on that. So rooted in the principles of Mbutu, I am a person because you are a person. That's how Mami Itihari Ture out of ITC describes it. Often we hear, um, I am because we are. But she said that my humanity is wrapped up in how I treat you. So I'm not fully human if I don't treat you as a human. So I'm a person because you are a person. We seek to deepen relationships and trust and build capacity and foster greater collaboration by building trust-based relationships, organizations and individuals can support and strengthen their capacity by sharing resources, exchanging ideas and collaborating. And finally, while we're here tonight, resource mobilization. For self-help, the mutual aid and benevolent society, we stand on the shoulder of our ancestors to continue the legacy of resource mobilization, organizing our time, talent and treasure to serve our community. So again, this is our first phase, our map, we can search um, over 150 organizations based on area of focus um, and neighborhood. We launched with our monthly micro grant. Organizations submit a two to three minute video. Um, and the integrated principle in Nagusa Saba, one of the seven principles of Kwanzaa, a way of us beginning modeling how we center our values and movement building, particularly in decentralized movement building and networks. Um, since March, we sort of reimagined the Black Futures mm -hmm. micro grant and launched the Baltimore Black Led Solidarity Fund with the goal of providing 50 um, $500 micro grants, we surpassed our goal. And since March, we've put over $200,000, no strings attached, micro grants into the black community, um, ranging from $500 to $10,000, most recently made three um, grants in partnership with Calais Campbell, of Baltimore Raven of $10,000. And some of our work that we're really interested in getting to this, this year is really some of the network weaving, relationship building, 
work, right? We said that we're gonna spend the first two years relationship building. So we, we did that, trying to foster deeper trust, um, the micro grants and building bridges within community. And now we move on to the more intentional phase of finding opportunities to, to collaborate and partner. Then we'll move as an action network where ways in which we can cluster organizations that may have some of the same missions <coughs> to partner on various um, opportunities and then a support network. What are sort of the systems that we need in place to support our organizations? Uh, this is an example that I show sometimes it is a sister who applied for a micro grant. She did not receive the micro grant, but we're able to connect her with organizations that already exist in the community. So not always funding, sometimes that resource mobilization really is uh, sort of closing the triangles that would say a network weaving, connecting to uh, resources that already exist within our community. So we have, again, organizations like Dia Family, 90 Community Network, um, Pan-African Liberation Movement, quite a few organizations that organize community cleanups. So she didn't really need bags or rakes or any tools. Like we have folks in the community that were more than willing to help and assist with this. Uh, so, but so we're not the bottleneck, right? We'll launch our app in March um, called Connect. So we're not the one sort of closing the triangle, but that folks now have a platform where they can meet, connect and build and collaborate. So a place to share resources, a place to share knowledge, a place to search for those who may be grant writers and who may help with, with funding. We'll begin to sort of network all of that together. This is sort of like a LinkedIn platform for black social change. And we're looking forward to launching that in March. So for folks out there who are interested in sort of helping us as we, uh, so to launch our beta, please reach out. We'd love to have you uh, join us. Uh, and then collective design. I spent about 18 weeks in 2020 in the relationship building cohort. Um, and we want to bring some of that to, to Baltimore, putting um, together maybe 10 organizations or leaders um, to look at the systems and structures that, that have historically separated us. These ideas of scarcity versus abundance, collaboration versus competition. Um, what, are, what does relationships for community building look like? What are some of these shared values and virtues for community building? Um, what I call MLK to Baker is that, that network weaving and network knitting process, peer-to-peer um, -peer learning, resource mobilization. Um, the story is of us, right? We are interdependent people. We are not uh, individualistic people. We are interdependent people. So we want to tell the story of us. Of course, use Connect as a, the ability to maintain these relationships and connect going further. This is something that uh, I found in your book. So I thank you for this. This is the Galilean Fisherman. And I wanted to share this with, particularly with Baltimore folk, that this is um, an organization that launched in what, 1856, incorporated in 1869, a benevolent society that furnished health benefits and burial costs at the time when insurance um, commercially wasn't available to Blacks. So the organization had over 250,000 in land assets to bank in Virginia and became one of the largest African-American organizations um, with over 5,000 members in Maryland in 1890. So we know that there's a long history. Again, this is not new to us, but true to us. We definitely stand on the shoulders of, of our ancestors. And tonight, we thank you again for, for Dr. Caroline Hussein, who's joining us, author of Black Social Economy in America, exploring diverse community-based markets, also a documentary, the Banker Ladies documentary. I'll make sure I'll post that link as well for folks who are interested in, in I know you'll speak about it a little later on um, in the presentation, but the, please check out the Banker Ladies documentary as well. Again, we thank you uh, for joining us, Dr. Caroline Hussein. She is Associate Professor of Business and Society in the Department of Social Science at York University in Toronto, Canada. She is the founder of Diverse Solidarity Economies Collective, author of award-winning, politicized microfinance, money, power, and violence in Black Americas, and co-author of Black and Society, sorry, Business and Society, a critical introduction and editor of the Black Social Economy in America, exploring diverse community-based alternative markets. He's the founder of the Diverse Solidarity Economies Collective, made up of 20-plus Black and racialized feminist leaders. In 2020, Dr. Hussein received the Rodney Higgins Best Faculty Paper Award from the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. And in 2017, he received the Helen Powder Award for Best Journal Article for the Association of Social Economics. Again, welcome Dr. Caroline Hussein. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'll stop my share. Should I start? I'll start. There you go. Well, thank you very much. That's great. 
Um, that was a wonderful introduction. I am so, I have to say that I'm so impressed and humbled to be um, here with, at um, Collectively. Um, just such an impressive breadth of work that you're doing. I can't believe, like, if I had to imagine my work become real life, it would be something like Collectively. So it's just amazing that uh, we found each other, actually, um, because so much of what I think about is what you're all doing. Um, um, and I just wanted to say that I am a New Yorker by birth, so I'm an American out here in Toronto, um, but I was raised in Toronto and have lots of connections to Florida. So I'm shouting out both of those states. Um, so I want to I want to say thank you and send my blessings to everyone who's made time to come to this talk. I know that the sacrifice you make as we live through a global pandemic. Um, before I start my talk, and I'm going to be mindful of time because it'll take about close to an hour, and so I want to be mindful of time. Um, I do, would like to give some land acknowledgments. Uh, we all sit on unceded um, Indigenous territory and lands. We are most grateful to be able to work, play, and live on these lands. I also want to recognize my own ancestors, those who were enslaved and helped build these lands, and who many BIPOC people still toil under unjust pay. And part of what our duty should be is to find ways to create these alliances between Black and Indigenous people. So um, I'd like to thank, I would like to make sure that I say that acknowledgement. Um, thank you, Jamie Wooten, uh, Tanay, uh, the family at Collectively, um, all of you there today for inviting me to give this lecture. It's titled The Black Social Economy, the African Diaspora Experience in Solidarity Economics. Um, oh, I can't. It's not letting me share. Can you go to the next slide? Did you share my document or? Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry, it's my fault, Jamie. Um, so you can see that I'm publishing. Um, Jamie already mentioned one of the books that everyone's reading. I was very heartened to see it on his Instagram um, with people actually reading it. And part of me as a scholar, um, what I wanna do is to make sure my work is accessible by people. Um, um, please be in touch with me. Now you all know me. Um, so if there's ways that I can push forward and legitimize and bring any kind of um, credibility to the work that you're doing, now you all know me. Um, um, I'm pretty much vested in community. Uh, more this later this year, I'm going to have a book called Community Economies in the Global South. Um, this should be a really exciting book. It's going to be produced by Oxford University Press, one of these very elite presses. And I'm I produced this edited collection with some really phenomenal authors, with my colleague Christabel at in Kerala University in India, and we're really documenting and understanding the experience of mutual aid and informal collectives around the world. So really really trying to acknowledge global south and global majority people, whether you're in the north, like in the US or Canada, or in other countries in Africa and Asia and what have you, that we have a very long standing centuries old tradition of collectivity. Um, I am the founder of this um, organization collective called the Diverse Solidarity Economies Collective. Check them out on my website. There's tons of women like me who are committed to decolonizing uh, mainstream economics because it needs to be done if we're going to have any hope of having some sort of equity in our value in terms of the labor that we do in our societies. Um, our brothers and sisters in um, Brazil are just under so much duress currently with their state. Um, I was um, giving some um, keynotes there. They organized a phenomenal quilombos. If people want to know what that is, it's like the maroon um, uh, cooperatives. It has a longstanding history and they're really reaching and making sure they're trying to build up the quilombos to contest the kinds of atrocities that are happening to Afro-Brazilians. So tonight, what am I going to talk to you about? I'm in the middle of um, working through a work that I call in progress. So I like that we're having this conversation. So know that the work that I'm, I'm sharing with you tonight is really in its kind of, it's in a messy stage of revision. 
And so I welcome your ideas and um, just know that it's live research. You can see that my work is funded both federally and provincially by the Canadian state. My work is not just looking at sort of the historical oppressions that our people face. Um, we recognize that this happens in various contexts where we are seen as quote unquote the minority. Um, but what I'm trying to do is to align the work that I'm doing to show the agency, to show the contributions that we make in cooperativism. And that aligns with the, the UN de decade for persons of African descent. So what I'm gonna speak to you today about are black women who organize these collectives called Roscas, and I'll speak to that in a moment. But I wanted to give collectively a hit, like you know, a shout out for having three Black women lead your conversation this month for Black History, and so that doesn't that message doesn't go unnoticed. So thank you very much for making that and recognizing the labor that Black women do in terms of community organizing. Um, um, so. So what I like to start, usually when I, before I start talking about mutual aid and collectives, I like to talk about the logic of cooperation because so much of mainstream economics has denied that collectivity matters in the ways and why people would want to organize in order to uphold this individualized form of business. But it actually makes complete sense for people of African descent to cooperate and to collectively organize, considering the intense forms of exclusions that are existing in business and society. Um, there are so many anecdotes, right? I can speak to those of Toronto. You, I'm sure you can speak to those of, Montre um, of Montreal or those of you that are in Baltimore, DC, Philadelphia, Boston, can totally speak to the kinds of atrocities that people, Black people experience when you want to do a mundane task like make a banking deposit, right? Or withdraw your own money like Dana Mohammed in Toronto, a very cosmopolitan part of our city, walked into a major bank, the Royal Bank of Canada, and was held up and humiliated because she wanted access to her money. They questioned and viewed her suspiciously. These kinds of indignities that are happening for very mundane tasks makes, makes it understandable why we would want to try and create our own forms of collectivity and self-help. And that to actually imagine that countries like Canada and the US that deliver aid to many of these countries in the global south, where many people of African descent and racialized people live, with this idea that we understand inclusion and equity when right here in our own territory we're actually abusing and discriminating against people for no just reason so you can see sort of you know sort of the inconsistencies of how we deliver assistance overseas and then right here in our own backyard we mistreat quote unquote these visible minorities with people of african descent at, usually at the bottom of that pyramid in terms of the ways they are treated and the context should be not, you know, you know, congratulations to my fellow Americans for making sure that sense has, you know, prevailed. But actually a coup d'etat actually happened in the beginning of January in the name of white supremacy. You know, this kind of hostility and terrorizing of a certain group of people is something that has been so ingrained for for a very long time because the actual project of capitalism is rooted in immorality, right? It's in, rooted in the slavery, the enslavement and 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 you know, the politics of extraction to build up white western countries. And so um, once we understand the context, right, of the, the in, in the places that we live across the Americas, right, then you start to understand sort of the connection that we as a diasporic people have with one another, whether it's in Canada, the US or the Caribbean. And I think it's important to note that Canada is often seen as the good country, right? Um, but you know, it has had its share of problems, and we're not—we're only starting to own up to it because a global pandemic took place to shame our country with the really gross inequities that actually exist. And so, 
when must we understand the unequalness that exists in our society and that people of African descent have to seek refuge in what we call the third sector or the social economy or all these sort of alternative ways that people want to sort of live. Um, I think the Galilean uh, model of the benevolent society was a great example that Jamie showed because it shows that there was this alternative model that this sort of acknowledgement that there's always been this concept of cooperating together. And so what I've been working on for the last seven years is this concept of the black social economy. It still needs work in terms of getting word out for us to start making it part of our language, for it to be recognized. Um, and what the black social economy does is push against sort of, you know, generic language that only see something called the social economy or solidarity economy to really acknowledge black contributions to cooperativism and the ways in which we protest and organize for our own livelihoods, including mutual aid, right? The global pandemic has sort of, it's been made to seem like mutual aid is something new, right? There's been a rebirth that white people have now figured out that there's a thing called mutual aid, but there's actually nothing very new about that, right? And so there's Jamie holding the book, but that's the way that this kind of concept becomes really ingrained, right? This idea that the black social economy is something that is purposefully informal in the social solidarity economy because it's unable to engage with private sector and at times the state. And so when I speak about the social economy, what I've done is really like attach it to something that's extremely tangible so that we can all understand. Yes, there's a body of theory and political economy that I'll get to in a moment, but I really wanted something tangible that kind of is like a like an example of, of what we do as people of African diaspora. And the best example that we all know are these systems of collectivities known as, formally academically known as Roscas. And I'll take it slow. Rotating, savings, credit, associations. And these are a global phenomenon. So not just African descended people are using them. They are being used in India's chit funds, in the Arab world as Gamea, in China and other Southeast Asia countries like Indonesia as Arisan or Hua in Vietnam, and the list goes on. This is a global majority invention, and we should be proud of it. It is, has deep roots in Africa, and when ancestors move to various parts of the world, um, they brought these technologies with them. So we should be acknowledging our really ancient traditions of collectivity. And you can see that people don't go around calling them Roscas. I'll be calling them Roscas for this talk. But generally, you can see here the variety of names they're called. Some of you might know them as Susu, Ajo, Tontine, Tandas, Junta, Hashiena, Sanduk, but you get the idea. Anywhere in the black world, people have their own vernacular for these systems called Roscas. Roscas are self-managed cooperatives that are informally organized by their members. People pool resources at a given point. They decide, they structure these systems. And it's like a savings bank, if you think about it, post-tax, and then they confer it to each member in, in an order that the group decides, usually based on consensus. And so where are these Roscas located? And I like to always show everyone, I don't want to assume that everyone understands what the third sector is and how it relates to the whole economy, but you all know the third sector is this old term. We often call it the social economy here in the West. Uh, some people call it the solidarity economy in most parts of the world. But the, if you look at this Venn diagram, the yellow part depicts this third sector where I say we're all of life happens, right? Um, but you, there is this often in academic literature, this sort of assumption that the, that the third sector will engage with business and the state. But what if you're a people that is continually oppressed and humiliated? Why would you want to engage with either of those actors? So what I've done is put a, you can see this sort of 
there's an X or a star here. <laughs> that's where that's where Roskas reside, deep in the civil society. They are unapologetically detached from business and public sector, sector because they're reaching people who are completely alienated from business and society. They're doing things on their own terms. And that's kind of aligns with so much literature that feminists have been producing in our world. I urge all of you to join um, and I can help you join. There's this wonderful research network with lots of practitioners join. We need actually more black folk in this, in this network. It's a listserv, it's free, and it's called uh, CERN, Community Economies Research Network. And these feminists by the name of uh, JK Gibson Graham have always argued that once you travel to other places, you start to really realize pretty fast that the concept of community economies have, has always been on our planet. So they kind of smash up this sort of binary or this knowledge making where we have sort of right, left, capitalist firm, socialist <laughs> collectives, you know? And they're like, no, people in our world are generally engaged in, in things that are informally organized, that are concerned about self-provisioning, that is concerned about neighborhoods, helping each other, cooperatives, informal, and they have likened all of this to an iceberg. So that's sort of what's before you. <laughs> so when we think of the corporate firm, that's really a small part of what's happening in our planet. When you think about our entire planet, the capitalist firm is just that tip of that iceberg that we seem to be so fixated on. And what these feminists are saying is that really most of human life's interactions happen below the surface. And so we should actually be thinking about, wow, we are a part of something that is enormous and that we're not this informal thing that should be viewed as something suspect, right? And so who am I speaking to is something that's really important, I think, um, um, because people, and you know, I told you this is messy data, but I'm speaking to uh, pretty much all black women across um, five different Caribbean countries, including Canada, two major cities, Toronto and Montreal, for some comparative texture. I use, I, I mean, I've spoken to hundreds more who are stakeholders and activists, but I actually wanted to speak to the users of these mutual aid and Roska groups who have often decades of experience doing this. Um, and so when you look at these numbers, Understand that these people who organize these Roskas, these informal cooperative groups where they pool money amongst each other, these groups can range anywhere from seven members to upwards of 80 members or more. I actually met a group of Cameroonian diaspora people who had over a thousand members and they were doing most of their mutual aid electronically. Okay, and so they were really interested in other sort of major asset building. Okay, so when you think about this, it's just think about the impossible, the things that could be done with the kinds of resources that can be mobilized from within is just awe inspiring. The 440 number is something that you should pay attention to because I'm speaking to the direct banker ladies who represent many, many women behind them. So multiply that at at least by a factor of 20. And so when I'm speaking to you with my findings, you'll understand there are actually thousands more behind these banker ladies, right? Um, and, and so I'm gonna carry on. Um, when you speak to that many black women as an academic, and I think that I urge everyone listening, if you're, spe you're, if you're reading about people of African descent, then you actually need theorizing and ideas that are reflective of the very people you're analyzing. Far too often, there are scholars who are studying our people, but they're using very Eurocentric ideas to unpack the findings that they have. And at this point in my career, I'm actually really fed up of that because it's not like people of African descent and particularly those of the diaspora don't have our own literatures. We have so much of it, right? 
so much of it. And I've tried to group them here, you know, but racial capitalism, particularly when you live in the US context or you're living in the Canadian context, this is something that's extremely relevant to understanding why there's so much inequities. So when Jamie tells you that young black men of a certain age make 28% less than anyone else, well, there's not going to be a catch up game unless we start addressing this racial capitalism. Um, ideas of Jessica Gordon Nembhard, um, many of you may have know of her. She wrote this terrific book. My work builds on hers called Collective Courage. She's pushing for this idea of intentional communities. A lot of the cooperatives she studied are formal, but she actually recognizes that African Americans have had to have informal ones because it was too dangerous to be formalized, right? That's an important part of history. Marcus Garvey, Du Bois, Nina Banks in Pennsylvania, all of them are speaking about the community activism that has been so important to Black people in the U.S. and beyond. Tiffany Hill Willoughby Harrard is a professor at the University of Irvine. She questions traditional conventional philanthropy as being somewhat very much a part of a white sort of project to contain people of African descent and to be wary of traditional forms of philanthropy because that has been its homework, right? It's to contain us. And so I'm going to start with my findings now, if you don't mind. And I just wanted to like, um, uh, just let you know that um, some of these findings are extremely messy because remember, this is a project that I, I haven't finalized yet. I'm still working on the book. The pandemic happened. I'm online teaching. So all my findings are a little bit, I'm still under the revisions and the pandemic is making me think about things in new ways. So forgive me if everything that I share with you today isn't, you know, as perfect as it can be. And I welcome your critiques and ideas as I work through this in the next few months. But what I'm going to present are the findings of those 400 plus women who represent thousands more who have spoken to me about these Roska systems um, in six different countries, Canada and several countries in the Caribbean. And what they're speaking to us about, and this is great lesson. I know I'm speaking to many Americans, but you know, we are connected in such fundamental ways, particularly when we think about the Canadian context of Toronto and Montreal with what, you know, what does it mean to be Black Canadian? And what does it mean to be a Black American? And what have you? Um, so overall, banker ladies are telling us what they do is, is do business differently. Okay, they're, they're engaged in a cooperative way of organizing the economy. That's what they're doing. And so the first, the first finding is under this umbrella of accountability. So I'm going to throw at you a bunch of things that kind of look like this. For so, so many years, <clears throat> the idea of people helping themselves through self-help has view, been viewed as something like, you know, we're pushing people on survival mode and then we're schooling them to take care of themselves, all a part of this bootstrap development. But the lady, the banker ladies in the film you'll see will tell you the contrary. They will tell you that um, aid actually can be problematic. They understand how to fix underdevelopment and some of the inequities that are happening because they live in a hostile environment. And some of the, the supports we think we're helping them with uh, isn't really effective enough. And so they have solutions that they've had handed down. And so one of these are these Roska groups. And so I'm going to let just play a little bit. It's only like 46 seconds or something of the trailer of this film that you can reach free on Films for Action. And I ask you to share it. Um, this was um, the director, Esri Montazir, um, out of Toronto, actually uh, directed this. So have a listen. But also, so if you have it in your country, you still bring it. So when you go, you meet people from your country, you say, oh, you remember also? So they say, yes. You remember when we used to be back home? So why don't we do it back? So we, we developed a structure that was different, slightly different than the one that my mom and her friends used. And you taught me to help. When we have a group of 10 of women to $200, I get the $2,000. That make me independent. I feel a power. So I have something. 
So they're just amazing, right? Like, um, let me just see how I get the, to the next one, to the next slide. There you go. That's just amazing. We feel the power. That's Mabinti, right? Like, um, um, we're not waiting on handouts. Uh, we know how to figure out and take accountability for one another. This is kind of that idea that we can pool resources to realize our dreams. They're, they're also underlining this importance of the social dimension. And asking this question about digitization makes absolutely no sense in some of the places that I went in the Caribbean, but it actually would have lots of relevance for those of us in Canada and the US, right? Um, we wanna know, you know, how active are banker ladies how often are they using more digitized forms of banking? Are they joining sort of these modern technologies that we force upon them? And when I asked the question, you can see with ATMs, 76% um, of them are using them. Um, so that's there's like a high comfort level there. Um, but when you probe a bit, what they tell you is that it's not the preferred way of banking. They prefer for it to be personalized. They prefer to have a branch office that they can walk in and speak to someone like a human being in a civilized way. But unfortunately, in many cities in North America, banks are don't exist or they move out of low income black communities. And instead they put these sort of cash for money and these usury systems or you know payday lending stuff with really high fees. So ATMs are actually available nearby relatively so they'll use them sort of like as last resort when i asked about online banking the story changes about th only 35 percent use it and when i used to share that data people used to be like what canadian women are not using online banking are you sure you got that right it took a global pandemic for now people to believe me that that data is actually correct and remember, these women are representing hundreds more, right? People are not interested in online um, banking, and a part of it has to do because of the digital divide. They either don't have enough data, it's not reliable, they don't trust it. And the ones that are using it, so many of them rely on their Canadian educated kids who are familiar with technology. But can you imagine some of the complications that has as a mother to have your children involved in your money business? But you can see that what they're underscoring here for us is that knowing your banker, be having a relationship in, with money is actually humanizing. No matter where I traveled um, across um, the country of Haiti, I heard this. Je connais les caisses populaires avant que je suis né. This idea that no one has to tell me about what collectives, credit unions, cooperatives are, because we have a historical tradition. Haiti is known as the Cooperative Republic. It's about an hour and a half from Miami. Haitians were the first Black Republic that freed themselves from the great Napoleon army. And a lot of that, that technical skill to defeat such a European army came with their knowledge of collectivity, combit and groupement. Haitians have this sort of understanding of what collectives and cooperatives are for hundreds of years. My second finding, and I'm kind of calling it loosely this quiet resistance, this way to rebel against commercialized banks that, that discriminate against people of African descent in the Americas. But I'm still not tied to it, but I do see that there is a kind of political stand. It's much more than, hey, we're just sort of getting along with each other and these are ancestral connections. But there is a militancy that I'm witnessing with some of the banker ladies, um, but they're not doing it in this very aggressive way. It, it's quite dignified actually. So let me start. So um, uh, the history of collectivity goes back so we can all, 
in the Americas, we can thank Haitians because they beat the Europeans, as I mentioned, and had this collective understanding of what combit and groupement meant. Um, they were able to um, imagine a world and or do the unthinkable that Michel Trudeau, um, uh, uh, I think he was a professor at Wesleyan in Connecticut, said that the Haitians did the unthinkable to the world. They questioned sort of the slave project and these plantation economies. Throughout Haiti, a lot of their business is run by a very intricate system called Systeme Pratique by these Madame Saras, who actually really are the lifeline of business in that country when elites have corrupted it and denied the Munandeo so much, Haitian people still continually to persevere. America invaded and wanted to occupy, and they did occupy Haiti for a few years in the 1930s. That's when we started witnessing more formalized versions of cooperatives. Haitians will tell you that we don't need you, we don't need Westerners to come and teach us about cooperatives. We actually know this. And when I was studying professionalized finance about 10 years ago there, um, what I learned pretty fast is that their whole system is based on a cooperative banking system or a non-cooperative banking system. So it kind of gives you this idea of the ways in which they prioritize banking. And it's usually through this membered own idea. Um, a very famous, um, a well-known political scientist at U University of Virginia, Robert Faton, argues that, and he studies authoritarianism, and he says the country of Haiti is not devoid of, of democracy. On the national stage, you have a lot of very oppressive, um, um, uh, corrupt elites, but when you want to see ample amounts of democracy, and an abundance of it actually, you must go into those local spaces, and that's where you'll find these systems of groupement and combit and, and these cooperatives or these caisse populaires. There's a good film by, Pot called, um, by Eugenie Ulysses, I believe that she's now at the University of California. Um, she, with Mark Schuler at um, a University in Chicago, I want to say it's the University of Chicago, uh, Northeast Chicago, something like Northeast Illinois, something like that. They created this film called The Potomitan, which is a wonderful anthropological look at how Haitian women use soul to opt out of sweatshops. They actually say, no, thank you. We're going to try and figure out how we create our own wealth and what that looks like for our community so we can advance in the ways that we see useful. Um, and I found that really important because I was invited, as Jamie mentioned, uh, to the Ijima Cooperative. I feel like I'm a member of them and I adore the work they're doing. Um, and they're really interested in learning the kinds of ways that that other diasporic people are are facing adversity and able to contest it. So read this quote by Mummy in Grenada. I'll give you a minute to look at it. And so mummy, when you look at what mummy is saying, I wish I could see everyone because then I could see what, what you're thinking about what she's saying. Um, my ancestors come from Grenada and my great grandmother was a Susu banker in Trinidad actually, um, Maud Gittins. And that's sort of what her claim to fame was as she sold delicious, you know, street food and what have you. Um, so this is even still for me, a sort of, you know, a connectivity with those that came before me. So what Mummy is saying is that, you know, solidarity matters, um, that you can go to your banker lady who really does believe in this principle of trust and reciprocity, right? These seem like complicated terms, but they're actually African concepts of how we kind of give and take within community when we're feeling historically oppressed. Even though Mummy might participate in various forms of banking, it's her Susu banker lady that she trusts most and who also has faith that she is going to repay and honor the group. She says that we bind. I mean, that is a clue in 
that solidarity economics matters and that what she's saying like members around her is that they're pushing against this individualized form of shareholder types of business and that's something you know grenada is known for a lot of offshore banking but they're like that's fine you can have that but more than half the island actually is a cooperator and they believe in these systems both informally and formally now here's where we get to some tricky stuff and i think u.s context many people can get this in the canadian context when elites and people hurt us and are discriminatory and cause violence to our community we need to figure out how to opt out while i was doing research in guyana and trinidad there was a very strong form of anti-black racism occurring afro trinidadians and guyanese tapped into their own Rosca systems of box hand and susu as sort of a way out. There's actually a very excellent historian from who's who's at Morgan State, a historian by the name of Maurice St. Pierre. And he studied buying clubs in among Afro Guyanese during slavery, slavery and upon emancipation. And what he found is that these buying clubs really led to the development of this thing called the box hand um, because slaves imagined that they would be free. And they organized box or buying clubs with the idea that eventually they would purchase their freedom and that they would buy land. Like they were not going to be enslaved, neither were their future generations. And that's pretty powerful. And so you can see that box hand and um, susu is a way for people to congregate and you know disclose the harms that they face and and support one another. It's a it's a testimony and to validating sort of the entrepreneurial um, expertise that they have. In the Jamaica case, um, the violence uh, and brutality of corrupt political officials or informal leaders and i'm talking about gangsters they call them dons there it's a very complex urban territory but just to make it clear i could spend forever on them um banker ladies um uh would um use these systems called partner sometimes partner hand but basically these are a rosca informally um, organized by women in a community so that they don't have to participate in any sort of professionalized or targeted financial program that might make them feel compelled to uh, to be managed by this big man politics. And so what they're ultimately doing is rejecting any kind of corruption or sell out or uh, control by men who might be harmful. And I think that this is really, and this is why I say, is it quiet? Well, they're quietly doing it in a way that they keep themselves safe, but you can see the kind of bold and rebellious stake that they're making when they say, we don't need those formalized systems. We actually are capable of creating our own that keep our own socioeconomic grouping safe and content, right? This idea of what does Bob Marley say? Um, um, uh, uh, free your mind, sort of that free your mind from this like mental slavery, right? That's the idea here that we're talking about. And um, I like showing, I like saying that sort of Bob Marley quote because he actually comes from the same garrison or little area in Kingston as Mrs. Beryl in uh, Arnett Gardens, who's like, me love my partner. You know, she's an entrepreneur. She buys food stuff. She travels around to Panama, or she used to, to different islands, uh, buying and selling household goods, right? And it was all because of this thing called partner that gave her a lump sum of money when she needed it, when they would share within their collectives their savings. So one would wonder, well, do can does Canada have rebellious banker ladies? How could goody two shoes Toronto have problems or Montreal, right? Well, we have our own baggage. We have our own issues and quite intense forms of them of anti-Black racism, like any other place you do in the US. Um, um, banker ladies in Canada have a divergence here. Unlike our Caribbean banker ladies, it was extremely hard for me to carry out this research over two years. 
um, because they live in fear in Toronto and Montreal. Um, to organize these collectives, they do so under the radar because they understand that there is a negative perception of what they're doing. They are stigmatized for organizing collectives that actually build up civil society. They are viewed, and I will quote, they are called terrorists. They are called drug dealers, money launderers, people engaged in pyramid schemes. So when the police raid apartment blocks looking for drugs or quote unquote criminals, they will seize the monies of these women who are engaged in these legitimate and credible collectives or mutual aid groups. And this is the kind of violence that is being ha that is happening against Canadian women, black Canadian women, 90% of them said without hesitation, that there is a hostility that is happening towards them. So this is why they hide these systems. I asked them, well, do you think you're doing anything? Um, do you think that there's, you know, you're resisting? you know, formal lenders like mainstream banks, credit unions or cooperatives. Affirmative, yes, overwhelmingly 83% are saying what they do is an act of resistance because they refuse to comply with individualized, commercialized forms of discriminatory banking. And even if they use those banking systems, they are also participating in their own systems of mutual aid because of the other kind of benefits that they get from them that they do not get from these racist forms of banking. Now that's intense, right? That is really intense. They've, they're they in major cities, financial cities in Toronto and Montreal, and they're like, no, thank you completely. We will also devise our financial system. All the banker ladies, no matter where you travel in the Americas, the people who participate in these groups love them. They are well respected. They understand the ancestral connection to Africa. Whether they came to Canada through the Underground Railroad and they have African American heritage, when they settled as refugees in Canada, they used something called true bands. So African Americans actually do have a rich history. The actual Underground Railroad is a cooperative mutual aid network that was in hiding because to make it formal and known would have been extremely dangerous, right? Acknowledging our participation and contribution in what cooperative the cooperative system is, is extremely important. But the language around cooperativism in America and Canada has been one to only see those that are formal as being worthy, as being sort of major participants. And we have to change that. We have to change that. Cooperatives are, these kinds of collectives, in, as informal as they are, are not a primitive form of cooperatives. They're cooperatives in their own right. They're just a different form of them. And actually, they tend to top the list in terms of the types of financial devices that people use. And this research that I'm doing in the Caribbean, in Canada, speaking to people in the US, um, it doesn't really um, counter what I'm finding happening in other parts of the world. In fact, there was a large scale study done a few years back called Portfolios of the Poor, uh, where they interviewed hundreds of people about financial diaries, mostly working class people in Bangladesh, Kenya, South Africa, and India. And again, their systems of Stockwell, Chit, uh, Kitties, Itaiga, these are all Roskas, came out as the number one device because of the camaraderie, because of the life, the trust, the systems of consensus that people actually are participating in their own development. This is important stuff, right? That we don't need actually foreigners to teach us what collectives or bring us corrupt versions of microfinance to save us.
Unfortunately, we keep hearing, seeing these books called The Poor and Their Money, Microfinance for the 21st Century. They should rewind that because actually these Roska systems predate anything the West could imagine developing. So we have a very proud legacy is what I'm saying. People of African descent have a huge legacy and imprint on the concept of cooperativism. Um, and this is something that banker ladies in the Caribbean are revered for. Um, no matter where I went in the Caribbean, uh, banker ladies were respected. Elite bankers in fancy financial institutions were mimicking these systems of collectivity and mutual aid. They would use the names that the women use and call. So if they had a partner plan, they would put that. So can you imagine in your Bank of America, you walk in there and there's a True Bands bank or there's a Patna bank <laughs> plan, product line. I mean, the bankers in the Caribbean are savvy in that they recognize the pulse of the people who want these systems, right? Whereas in Canada, we're not acknowledging that these kinds of Rotskas actually matter to all of these people who have emigrated to our cities that make them very cosmopolitan. Instead, 101 anti-Black racism, we ignore these kinds of contributions, right? We deny and we don't want to recognize that they actually exist or give them credit for showing us how to do more equitable forms of community development. The third finding, which I find very exciting, and we should be also happy to hear about this because it'll take you to other places, is this idea that Roscas are globalized. So the work that you're doing, you think, oh, I'm just doing it here in Baltimore. But think of this, think of the legacy that it is. It's pretty profound. What you're doing in Baltimore, or Philly or Boston or Toronto is actually something that has connections to people in the global majority world. People around the globe are doing what you're doing. Make yourself a part of that global movement, and then you won't find that it's this isolating kind of strange thing that you're engaged in. Imagine ancestors leaving um, Senegal, Il Gori, or um, um, uh, you know the Port of No Return at the Elmina Castle in Cape Coast. As they were being forced into enslavement, they brought right things that were so and held on to these systems of you know food music dance art all these things right with faith language but they also brought with them their money systems and so how we've imagined our money systems and how they have survived these ideas of true bands and combit and susu and patna and you know, Sand Duke, these are all such important systems that we now see spreading throughout major cities in the global north. And um, there was a debate back in the 60s, actually started in the 60s by this American um, anthropologist, I believe he was at Columbia University, by the name of Clifford Gertz. And he was spending years in Indonesia looking at Ari Sands, which is Araska and found that, well, you know, he, he kind of hypothesized that as more formalized kinds of banking would take hold and get into the peripheries that, you know, these Roscas would become redundant. Well, along come these feminists in the 1990s, Shirley Ardner and Sandra Berman, and they respond to Gertz. And this is like decades later, right? And they say that, no, actually, Roscas have a staying power. And a lot of it is because women value these systems. There is a solidarity aspect to them that is extremely important to give people a sense of belonging when they feel so isolating, right? Or they have to adjust to a better way of life. Or there's a patriarchy that exists. So that's why I think it's so great, the collectivity for their uh, for your three first speakers are all these black women uh, showing us the way of what mutual aid looks like. So congrats to the group for doing that, because actually there is a very strong gendered um, aspect to these forms of mutual aid, not exclusively female, but there is a very strong gendered aspect. And it shouldn't be a surprise when we think about how community organizing is done and particularly in informal spaces. 
So um, when I want you to look at this woman called Munira Abukar, a, a young Canadian woman, she ran in some uh, city elections against um, a former mayor, a late mayor actually, and her election signs were vandalized, go back home. But she like, it's Canadian, as Canadian as can be, Munira. Her election was totally financed by something called Ayutu. Now, Ayutu is the Somali word for Raska. Raska money. Somali women came out in the droves to make sure she had the money available to fund her election campaign. She didn't win, but she will one day. Those Somali women are going to mobilize those resources again. It's a coming. So read this. This is a quote by Fardosa. She's a Somali born Canadian, came when she was quite young. Um, and what she's telling you is that Somalis are globalizing these major cities in the North. We're actually, she says, you might think that our Hagbad system that we use, that's Araska, is strange. But actually as Muslim, black Muslim women, we're actually contributing to Canadian society by innovating and bringing something you have no clue about. And we're doing this socially, <laughs> which is like amazing that these women are figuring out the inequities that exist in our society and of their own volition are contributing to civic society building. What I don't understand as a researcher is why our state, why are our governments, whether they're in Canada or the US, not financing these kinds of systems to assist us so that we can ensure that we have more equitable forms of economic development. Let us travel to places like Ghana. And I'll speak about, you know, India um, in a moment, but, but the idea of us formalizing and making mutual aid and these collective systems that collectively is thinking about is not so far fetched. There's a model in Ghana, Ghanaians have been doing the Susu system for literally centuries. In the late 80s, 1990s, they have started a system of formalization. It's a very slither of the market that they've done. I'm working with my, my, my um, collaborator, um, Professor Samuel Bonsu, looking at these SUSU systems in a number of cities in Cape Coast, Kumasi, Tima, Accra, and I'm trying to understand the formalized aspect of the SUSU system and you know what people think about it compared to the unregulated massive part of the SUSU system in Ghana. But what's important to know is the Ghanaian government regulates part of the a very small part of the susu system and there's an example of it one there um, it's in a shipping container it's called humility susu enterprise and it kind of operates like these microfinance banks and village banking and it goes out reaching people but what i like here is that the central bank has earned the trust of the people for the, that segment of the population that wants a different kind of banking and they think that the susu model is useful to them I mean, that shows some imagination, that shows some scope to push against only a certain kind of banking, that why not have a menu of it? That building there is the Ghana um, um, National Susu Cooperators Association. I brought them to Toronto. After three tries, we got the guy there so that he could speak to Canadian banker ladies about what formality looks like. I'm not sure they were convinced by it, but at least we should be having that conversation about mutual aid and imagine that knowledge making is not just in the West for us to figure it out. We can go to places like Ghana that were actually source countries. Another place that I think is really inspiring and I don't have a slide for it, but I was just at their conference last week and I thought I'd mention it, is the system of, I'm gonna say it slowly, Kundum Bashri. The Kundum Bashri, if anyone wants to put it in the chat, that's great, comes out of the state of Kerala in South India. 
Um, it is one of the world's most renowned ex example of gender equality and self-help and solidarity. I work with my 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 colleague and partner there um, in 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 writing books and Christabel Professor Pris Christabel P J. And um, she has been really involved in the Kundumbashri movement, something that started in the 1990s, 98. Um, basically, the government listened to the most marginalized women of very low caste, completely alienated from everything, and realized that they could have no development or a more just and safe society if they left out a good segment of their population. And so what they did was create this Kundumbashri movement by recognizing their informal collectives and started making a space for them initially just to have access to certain things. And now the Kundumbashri movement has millions of women in the state recognized program where they're actually influencing development goals. So there's possibilities. We have the Kerala model, you have the Ghana model, we need to travel in Canada and the US and not to assume that we have all the scientific knowledge, but there's actually other people in the world who are thinking about mutual aid in very innovative ways. So I leave you, I leave you with these beautiful uh, Raska group called Sisterhood. Um, they sent me this in the pandemic. And I find that, you know, what we have to remember as people of the African diaspora and I'm so grateful that so many of you are here with me today, is that we have a proud legacy of cooperativism, mutual aid, collectivity. There is this African origin that is extremely important, and it spans beyond our own geographies into many other spaces. And that it's not charity that is going to deliver us. In fact, philanthropy has been mostly problematic because it hasn't been thinking about solidarity in the ways that all of you are thinking, right? You're all thinking about this activist form of black owned collectives. That's powerful. I know I'm on your Instagram looking at all the winners <laughs> of these funds and, and looking at all the kinds of businesses and um, innovations that you're all doing. And that's what's important because what we're showing the world when we do mutual aid and solidarity is that we as a people who have been historically oppressed have the lived experience of what that means to collectively organize. So think about that. We have the lived experience to understand how to collectively organize, which basically also tells people that we are the ones who have the expertise of what equity and inclusion should look like when we're thinking about community development. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank all of you um, for giving me the time to share a little bit about of my work. I hope it wasn't too all over the place, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to have this dialogue. I think of this as a dialogue that we're all starting. Um, if any of you need me, um, you now know me. <laughs> um, so I'm not hard to find. There's my email. I'm on Twitter causing a lot of trouble. Good trouble, they say, right? John Lewis, good trouble. And I do, I do hope um, and, and, and look forward I hope that we meet in person in real life one day, but I also um, going forward, um, really excited about the kinds of projects you're doing and hope to learn more. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Hey, thank you. Trying to get this video back. Thank you so much. I think it's an um, amazing way for us to kick off this this series uh, for you connecting the global dots of all the ways in which we have historically uh, been collective. Amazing people. <laughs> I'm not biased. <laughs> for some reason, it's not allowing me to pop back on on video. A few folks have asked um, about the. Can sharing. I try and see how to make? I'll make you a host. There you go. Does that make sense? Yep, yeah, there we go. Okay, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you again. This, this, this was amazing. It's powerful. The, the book is powerful and I hope folks will also go out and get that. Um, we have a few folks in the chat who have asked about 
um, presentation. I know you did send me a copy of that, so we can send out um, the presentation as well as the links to uh, the banker, the banker later's um, video as well for folks who are interested. Yeah, in I'll it. put the yeah. The, if someone can throw in the chat the link for the, it's on Films for Action, um, and it's called the Banker Ladies. It's free. It's totally been subsidized by my the government. Um, so I try to make things as open access. On my website, I have some free open access um, pieces for people who want. Um, yeah, and if you email me and you can't find things, um, I try to uh, support individuals. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have a great uh, question in, in, uh, in the Q&A that says they're wondering if there are stories about how conflict was handled in these suits. Oh, that's a good that's a good question. Who asked that question? I didn't see it. I'm really thanks, Jamie, for regulating that. Mm -hmm. I see the full name. Can, but can I hear people? Can I hear people or you know, no? Sean, is Sean and Mary Brown probably? Yeah, that's a great, great question, Sean. No, I see she did it through the Q and A, so he just typed it in. Oh, I see. Okay, so that's a great question about. Um, I, I would like to call it the downsides of um, Roscas. Um, they do exist. I didn't ask, I didn't mention them. I just spoke about all this romanticizing aspects of them, but there are definitely downsides. Um, what I want to say is that um, um, it's hard to get to the downsides with banker ladies. And you have to understand that when you've been a people who've been historically oppressed and you have to turn to these systems, you're very protective. Do you understand? Like you get very defensive of them, even when they don't work perfectly. But of course, there have been sort of down. There are downsides that I'm happy to speak to. But generally, this idea of there can be personality politics, sort of a favoritism of how things are allocated. But you have to remember that the group is kind of the decision making. They may have one banker lady that's sort of like the lead banker lady, but it's generally there is a consensus, right? These are based on African traditions of democracy. People come together, they have their own executive, they vote for people. Um, they figure out sort of how they sanction and penalize people. In parts of the Caribbean, it can be really intense. Like there's a vigilante. You mess with our money, our livelihood savings, there's gonna be some violence on there, you know? Um, other groups have things like they can ostracize you, they can blacklist you if you're not timely with payments or if you abscond with anything. Um, so there are those kinds of risks that do happen. But the thing is, if you live in a community, you rely on these systems um, and you lose the trust of these people, it's very hard for you to continue. So the kinds of um, conflicts that happen tend to be very low level, if you know what I mean. Um, but there are instances where there is some risk. So you can imagine why some people would be like, I'm into formality. I'd like to see some more protection. And in India, they actually do have these chit funds regulated and there are laws so that if things get stolen, there might be insurance or, you know, um, um, the police could actually take action, but right now these things are often so informalized that there is that vulnerability that can happen, but the group dynamic is actually a pretty sure way of managing conflicts, right? Because you're just not one individual. There's a number of you together, and it's a vouching system. It's not a bunch of strangers that are allowed to join a group, right? I'm in a susu right now. And I recommended to the banker lady someone. Um, she didn't necessarily know them, but she's going because she knows me very well. Um, so if anything ever happens, <laughs> um, I'm on the hook. Do you understand? Like, so there is this kind of a very strict process. It's a disciplining process of understanding who joins the group. I hope I answered your question. I can't see you, but if I didn't, email me. <laughs> I think that speaks to the level of trust and relationships and hold how one how groups hold each other accountable. Well, yeah, that's what, right. what are some of the, the sizes that you're seeing? Are you seeing what a sort of normal size of some of the social? I know these 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 Roscas vary. Like some Somali type groups can have large numbers of 50, 60 members. 
Um, if the group dynamic, it depends, you know, there are groups as small as six or seven. And then there are groups, Haiti, they would have like over a hundred. Mm -hmm. In Africa, it's not uncommon to have hundreds, literally. Some groups will charge if there's a lot of administration, something small. Um, other groups don't, it's totally like voluntary process of just us being together to do this self-help. Um, so the group size varies depending on on the group, the people who want to come together um, and what they're trying to achieve. But there is a fixed period, right? Like people decide on there's definitely a starting point and then there's an ending point. We have another question from Melissa says, how do you how do you disassociate entrepreneurship from our contemporary and capitalistic understanding of it? How do you separate um sorry, um I didn't entrepreneurship. Uh -huh, from from our contemporary capitalistic understanding of it. Yeah, that's a good question, Alyssa. Um, when we think about, you know, these concepts of entrepreneurship and capitalism, so much of that language has been co-opted, right? Um, we're assuming a lot of it because, you know, Europeans have this idea that, that business operates in a certain way, right? And I do think more extreme variants of capitalism um, uh, actually are not good for people of African descent um, because it is, you know, if you buy into the ideas of Cedric Robinson's racial capitalism and so many people have written on it, then you start to question sort of the origins of sort of this extreme variant of capitalism. But, you know, there there's all this kind of other emerging forms of entrepreneurship. And I've lived in Africa. You see people, right? Like if many of you have gone to the Caribbean or you've, you know, traveled to places in, you know, Africa, you see people engaged in commerce. Commerce is what they call it, right? And entrepreneurship is a part of that. And it's about sort of like community. It's embedded in community enterprises. Um, my father has been a businessman for almost, what, 40 years or so. And part of his business as an entrepreneur is actually helping people. Like he does a lot of very unorthodox business things <laughs> because he's working with community. Um, he's built his business in a, a really, I think, Caribbean or immigrant community. And so much of how they do business is very family oriented, right? Um, and that's what sustains them. He's a businessman, but it might not be textbook business like, if you know what I mean. Um, so if you're interested, check out books on and ideas about sort of diaspora businesses and di uh, sort of, I think in the US they have the term, we use it sort of ethnic entrepreneurship, because what you start seeing there are the variety of ways, I call it the variety of ways that entrepreneurship takes place in places that are very cosmopolitan, like Baltimore and DC, New York, Toronto, what have you. Yeah, the, um, a follow-up question that says, has the experience of holding space for these stories changed the way you engage financially? And if so, what are the barriers to actualizing this in, in real life? In my life? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm a cooperator. Like everything, <laughs> every, you know, I fight with cooperatives. And if anyone wants to see, I'll send it to Jamie and he for sure has a list, I'm sure, right, Jamie? Um, yeah. But there is a link if someone's really fast and handy. If you Google this journal called um, International Journal for Cooperatives, Accounting and Management, you should find my open access article that speaks about locating sort of a black um, a black experience in Canada's cooperative history, uh, which has completely been erased. So I actually have this sort of tumultuous sort of complex relationship with credit unions and cooperatives in Canada, because I actually think that if they are not diversifying culturally in a meaningful way, and the literature on cooperativism has been quite white, I do find that this is racist and this is problematic um, uh, because it's not thinking about the ways in which people of color and particularly people of African descent have contributed to cooperativism. And, it, like, and I'm a cooperator, so I'm humiliated every time 
you know, I have to think about cooperatives and I'm a cooperator. I do my banking there, my insurance there. <laughs> like we have a major cooperative called Desjardins. Um, you know, I'm a part of Meridian. I'm a cooperator. So I try to situate my banking life as part of a member owned institution, understanding that even those structures are very white. And they, we have to push those structures. So that's my next project. My next project is taking up formal cooperatives to push them to count us. That even if you look at the International Cooperative Alliance that sits in Switzerland, uh, I think it's Switzerland, Geneva, they have an African seat. I asked them, well, where's the African diaspora? Oh, it's with the African rep. What? You have <laughs> the African diaspora under Africa, but there's a completely different context. We should be having our own sort of like seat in the International Cooperative Alliance. If anyone's interested in that, that's my next big project to take on because we have to have that space, right? In America, you have all these kinds of interesting credit unions that are black owned and, you know, you have cooperatives. I mean, I, I read Jessica Gordon Empard. I'm impressed by the works of Stacey Sutton and Renee Hatcher. They're all, you know, looking at the various ways that African Americans are doing cooperation. But still, internationally, globally, like, where are we? Why are we not being recognized in a more formal way? Yeah. We're actually going to bring Renee in in March to talk about sort of um, structures and how you create these sort of structures in, in a oh, a lawyer's perspective. That's oh, yeah. great. So that, that'll be exciting. Someone also said, are there recent, um, are there any recent collectives started by native born black Americans? So I'm not sure if that's like looking at some formal structures that you're familiar with. Yeah, well, you know, I think that um, I think in the South, actually, you should look up in the South for sure. Um, Jessica Gordon Nemhard's book, and I'm going to put that down here so that everyone has a collective courage, because I think that you should look check her book, Nemhard. Anyways, there it is. It's in the look at, at her book. She has it only goes up to 2010, but she has a list of sort of like African American sort of started cooperatives. But check out like the co-ops in Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi. Um, there, uh, the mayor who passed on Lumumba actually wanted to create make Jackson a cooperative city. Right. And so they have that they had this conference called Jackson Rising. And I do believe that they have a pretty important cooperative system there that is wholly African American. Uh, Soul Fire is it Soul Fire Farms, I think it's called. It's like Black Wild Farming. Um, she's doing a lot of work in upstate New York around the ideas of cooperative farming. And she's a pretty young African-American woman that has kind of given up city life to figure out about food. And, you know, how do we connect to African-American people in a more cooperative way through, you know, that kind of, that kind of living more sustainably, right? And respect the, respectfully, right? Um, but I do think if you check out um, Jessica Gordon Emhard, you'll find it sort of an archival. Renee Hatcher, who you're bringing, will also probably have lots of ideas about more sort of African American institutions. But Marcus Garvey, um, many of you know, um, his whole UNIA um, system uh, was a cooperative membership system, right? Um, and he, most of the, the kinds of businesses and the, the actual UNIA in Harlem was a cooperative model. So these ideas of cooperation and cooperatives is, you know, it's all around you actually, both past and present. Um, so much of the Black Panthers, um, community giving, breakfast programming, all of that was done through an informal, cooperative, in-kind model to build up people, right? Lift as we climb kind of idea. Okay, so we have another Q&A. So I'm really interested in the opportunity for cooperative economic active. I guess the activity within trans local communities, for example, members of the diaspora population, working around having international extractive banking that is skimming uh, remittance. 
it's kind of uh, tangential, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts. On what what is this? Like, I don't even understand that question, actually. What are they trying to find out about? Cooperative remittances? What are they? The questions. Keep them short and focused. Otherwise, then, because we don't have you live to explain them to us. <laughs> yeah, we'll do, I'll do better next time as well. No, it's it's hard with sometimes when people oh, are. Put in, it looks like you put it in the chat. Let me see if that helps you at all. Well, there's another one. Thank you for someone who put up Soul Fire Farm. That's great. That's a good link. Thank you, whoever did that. <laughs> I appreciate it. I don't see that question from the person. Um, Here it is. Says, There's so many questions. I don't have these. Jamie, you have to send me these chats. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we'll do all that. We'll save <laughs> it and record it. We're so engaged. So we I wish I could see everyone. We have a small, mighty group. I wish we could see everyone. I'm sorry that we're not. I, I feed off of a community. Thank you for putting up the Jackson Rising. So with remittances, yeah, there is there's something that I want to say about remittances in a more collective model. And I'm, I'm not sure. I guess I'm assuming. I wish I knew who was asking that because I wonder if you're Caribbean or a, from Africa asking me that question on remittances because I'm going to make an assumption that you're talking about remittances from America to somewhere else, like to the Caribbean or Latin America or, you know, Africa. And remittances is a huge sort of, you know, um, um, revenue, you know, transmittal that goes on between diasporic people to sort of their home countries. And actually, there's something called hometown associations, HTAs. And they're really popular in Mexico and popular among Haitians and a number of other sort of Caribbean Cubans. They have these systems where diasporic people who may come from the same region and then they move to a certain location in the US or whatever, they will sort of like pool resources and then send them as a more meaningful remittance to the place that they come from so that they can build infrastructure. So like better school system, better medical facility, um, which is kind of an interesting model if you think about it. Hometown associations, I'm sure there's lots written on it, but I used to look at it when I was, you know, when I used to dabble in something called microfinance because remittances were, would also come into that sort of arena for diasporic businesses. So check out hometown associations because I do think there's a way to do that collectively with other diasporic people who might by, have an interest in doing that for, say, Jamaica. Um, and they have an idea that instead of funneling money to, you know, my own family who will use it mostly on like consumption of a TV and what have you, or maybe they've been away for so long that they don't have all those close relatives, but they still feel a, a, like a, a connection and they want to do something. Well, there are ways to do more sort of development focused projects and maybe a hometown association where you collectively pool resources could be an idea. I'll write that in hometown associations for I don't remember who asked, but <laughs> that's such a good question. But again, it kind of like feeds into that other alternative, right, Jamie, that you guys yeah. are doing with mutual aid. Um, it, do you know if the person is from an island or something? Let me see if I can see them. <laughs> I can't see the full name. You can type your name if you like. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, there you go. Oh, that's it's it's called Luker, Luker Jordan. Might be Haitian. <laughs> you might be Haitian. Yeah, I said yes, thank you. That's exactly what I was curious about. Yes. Okay, good, good. Thanks, Someone asked Luker. about um their reaction to the idea of a state owned bank, the idea now being shopped in Maryland as an equity solution. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess state owned banks um, in Canada, we have a lot of those kind of sort of quasi state are we only have like six banks or something. And a lot of them are state, um, you know, really state managed, state owned, what have you. Um, um, but there's still inequities that are going to happen, like <laughs> um, because you have to imagine, I mean, I, I mean, that seems very pessimistic of me to say that, but you have to be sort of understanding is the government reflective of the society you live in? Yeah. You know yeah, I'm actually I mean? in a, um, a current cohort with uh, another brother here in Baltimore, Michael Scott, 
and we're looking at sort of integrated capital funds. So relationship trust-based lending, that way you don't look at credit scores, um, things of that nature, no collateral, but sort of building off micro grants and looking at micro, micro loans and other ways in which to lend, but are based on um, trust and relationship. Yeah, and also the ways in which you hire, I was looking at that in, in professionalized microfinance, like even those systems get corrupted and, and politicized around identity issues. If you're not hiring people who again are reflective of the very community you're helping, you understand? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, then you find those stigmas happening and re replicating and reproducing themselves in something that is supposed to be innovative and more inclusive, right? Um, so state banks might still be um, not have sort of, um, uh, I don't know, a blueprint on equity. Um, but I mean, I think it might be a different model because the shareholder model won't be there. So maybe perhaps there might be some kind of, um, you know, priorities given in the ways that we allocate resources, right? And the ways in which we diversify personnel so that they actually have the lived experience of the very people they're trying to help, then maybe I'd give some trust to these kind of state-owned banking institutions that could be useful. One case you might wanna look that state-owned banks have been extremely useful has been in Indonesia. And they have a phenomenal sort of rural network of, um, I think it's called the People's Banks. It's called the People's Banks. What It was like something fantastic. And they're all over, BRI, I forget it was called B, sorry, B-R-I, Bank, I don't know if I'm gonna spell it right, okay? It's in Indonesia. Bank Raka, Rakayat, 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 Indonesia, something like that, or Indonesia, Indonesia, I'm not sure. But anyways, it's BRI, Google them, because historically they've had a fantastic reputation as a state-owned bank that has actually been like sort of on the crusade of uh, social justice and trying to deal with inequities and biases that they have in their own country. So check them out, because it might be it's one of the very few models that I know of that seem to not have had become political because, you know, banks can also be very politicized, right? Like um, I know in Jamaica, a lot of state owned banks um, sometimes became political depending on where they're located and if they had any party affiliation. So you have to be sort of conscious of that, right? <laughs> I wonder across your research, have, are you looking at or have looked at sort of Black faith traditions in the ways in which they have sort of pulled their economic resources? Yeah, um, no, I have not looked at um, Christian faith, <laughs> but I have looked at Muslim women, um, Somali women in particular, because so many um, Somalis are excluded from traditional finance or conventional finance in banks because it's against their religion to take out loans that have an interest rate okay and you might find people from the nation of islam also have those constraints as well um and so i actually have a, a a friend, um, Zara Ahmed, who's at St. Mary's University, I think it's in Oakland, California, and she's actually trying to look at mutual aid and self-help and that kind of stuff within the nation of Islam, mm -hmm. and particularly among women, because of these kinds of constraints of, of interest rate, right? Um, so in that respect, I've looked at sort of how people do community building when through a religious sort of motivation, if you can say. But I know that within sort of church as well, like, uh, for example, a lot of my meetings or focus groups in Jamaica were held in some evangelical type of mm -hmm. churches because of the community that they lived in. That was a place that they could, you know, they, a lot of them were worshipers of a certain faith. And so partner, they would have their partner plan actually anchored in a women's group um, in a church. So the church often sometimes is the meeting place, 
for a partner to start. Also in Montreal, I found that a church, a Catholic church was a space for them to meet. And then when they did sort of extracurricular sort of, I don't know, baking sales or crafts, <laughs> they would be like, hey, let's do a catering project and let's throw a little susu here. Maybe we can make some money on this side and then give some of the profit to the church, you know? And so that, those kinds of ways is how I engage. But an actual study, particularly looking at, say, Christian faith, no, but Islam more so because of the context of what I'm looking at. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for, for joining us. This has been amazing. Appreciate so much the, the book and the resource and just the, the friend you have become and the continued resources that you share um, will definitely be a great, great benefit to us here in Baltimore. I'll continue to pass those forward. Um, if you have any final words, please, please share. And again, thank you so much. Thanks for the students and those who join from Canada as well. From I would Texas, like from Texas and California as well. Isn't it? <laughs> I love all those places. Um, I'd love to move to back to the US. I still have my house in uh, Pennsylvania. So I'd like to move back eventually. The weather is much more humane. But I would like to thank everyone for coming out, um, for taking the time for us to celebrate a Black History Month and to acknowledge cooperativism among people of the African diaspora, African Americans, Black Canadians, Afro-Caribbeans, we all kind of sort of, you know, um, travel together in so many ways and understand the legacy of, um, you know, enslavement, colonization, continued sort of harms that are happening. So we share these kind of commonalities. We have differences, but we, we are going to figure out how to merge our sort of alliances to make us a stronger people. And so I want to thank you, Jamie. I'm really impressed by the leadership of you and of the, the collectivity group. I hope that I can be your academic friend. I'm really Absolutely. interested in the work that you're doing, as well as everyone who's winning these amazing awards on the Instagram. Um, I thank you. I stalk all of you because I just <laughs> love the work that you're doing. Um, and I really do hope um, we can all stay in touch. Absolutely. Again, thank you. Thank everybody for joining us. Please join us um, next week. Again, Susan Batten Taylor will be our guest. Susan Taylor Batten will be our, our guest on Philanthropic Red Line. Thanks, everybody, for spending your evening thank with you. us. Talk to you soon.